Thank you for joining me for part three of Leo Stedman's interview. This is my grandfather, which our family sat down and interviewed him in 1993. So this has been converted from an old VHS tape. And I'm trying to re-piece this thing together. There's some really interesting stories here about um, what the Navy was like before uh, World War II. My grandpa talks about... He has a really interesting story about how he basically got super lucky and escaped uh, the Dust Bowl that was Oklahoma, that poverty of the uh, Great Depression, and how he got into the Navy and what the Navy was like when they were running with no money. Because, you know, today they just throw billions of dollars at the military. Uh, it's like an endless checkbook. So back then, this is before all that happened. And they're, he's talking about how they're like, they don't have any money for fuel. So they're like pretending to do drills and, and they don't have money to shoot, you know, ammo. They're, they're like tying a, a very small gun to the large guns to fire it. And just like, it's very interesting stories to hear that time period and, and what existed back then. Um, and also just about the depression was, he's got uh, some insight about that too. So enjoy this piece of history. You'll hear my brothers peppering him with questions uh, because he didn't really talk a whole lot. So I hope, you know, looking back that we, it was probably good they prodded him along to get this information. So enjoy this. I didn't have any money. You didn't have any clothes. My parents, but by that time, us two boys gone, the business had just shot. I mean, they didn't have, you couldn't hire anybody to do it. And so there was, there was just no money. So I worked that summer, got a job at Oklahoma City Mill Elevator in Oklahoma City. It was just a summer job, and that was over. I couldn't get a job any place. Let me ask you a question. Is the reason you couldn't get a job because it was the depression? Oh yeah, it was the depression. Let's talk about that a bit. Uh, you know. Well, that was a real depression. <laughs> what was going on in Oklahoma, and, and what year are we talking about? Thirty, thirty-one. What was Wait a second, Rob. Because you were there when the, when the stock market crashed, shit, in 1919. Oh, yeah. You were still. 1929. 1929. That's the year I graduated from high school. Wow. And what happened to your family that year? Well, we just kind of went down. Dad, I mean, one of the big uh, disappointments that I had in government at that time, Dad, I think he, he went to the bank during the winter to do a hangover and borrowed, I think, I don't know, four or five hundred dollars. And uh, when the summer came, why their business picked up, why we were going. We had we had enough money to he had enough money in the bank to pay it off. But he was building it up to take care of things. The bank went broke. Wow. And he lost the money he had in there, but we had to pay back the four hundred so the the money is uh, that I never could understand as a kid. <laughs> I couldn't understand that. But anyway, I was in thirty. One, I got back, came back, I had gone to school, 29, third, I graduated high school, 29, went to college a half a year, I couldn't get work, one time I joined a uh, magazine, where we drove from town to town and solicited uh, all kind of lies and whatnot, selling magazines. But we were honest when we took a subscription, they got it. But we used all kinds of excuses and forged verifications of what we were doing. <laughs> Sign the mayor's name to them, <laughs> run through it, and then leave town before the mayor called us. <laughs> but uh, I did that for about, we did that for about six months. And I, would, I never liked it anyway. I, could, I can't sell anything. I couldn't sell. Why is that? I just don't like salesmanship. I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. uh, Leo, uh, what about uh, before you go on too far now, was there any other girlfriends in high school or college? After oh, well, we had girlfriends, but nothing ever got serious. Uh -huh. Never any serious. So not, not a college? 
No, I didn't have any money to go to college girls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> could, I, uh, you could have found a rich one to take care of you. <laughs> but in high school, we always dated somebody. We had, and uh, so when I got back, I got back home and there was no money. So I went over and decided that to join the Navy. How old are you? Well, let's see, I was 31, so I was 21. <laughs> was, it, was, over, it hard, was it hard to join the Navy in the Depression? I went over to the recruiting station and I took my list. Took, I got my name on the list, and there was better than a nine-month waiting list to get, to even get called up. So I went back home, and Dad, we were still, he was still wrestling with the soda water. And I got a call about a month late after I went over to the, and called up and says, "Can you get over here?" He says, "We got somebody that flunked out, and we need a substitute." Uh, Why did you pick the Navy? I don't know. There was no reason. I'd been around the Army or uh, Fort Sill. I didn't like it. <laughs> so you thought the Navy was the way to go? Oh, so I had the biggest pond of water I'd ever seen. I couldn't throw, <laughs> I could throw a rock across. So I was. <laughs> and anyway. How, how'd your parents feel about it? Uh, how'd your parents feel about it? Oh, they were glad to. And anything to get a job then was money. So I, uh, they called up. Dad. I had on a pair of overalls. They said, you got to get over here within about an hour and go to Burke Burnett, Texas. That was 12 miles away. I didn't even change underwear, socks, shoes, or nothing. We got in the truck and away I went. Well, Pop, I don't understand. Somebody failed? Huh? Somebody failed? Yeah, I failed physical at the final. But, but you had to go through a physical first. Oh, yeah. I, well, we'd already had a temporary physical. I see. But this, then you go back for the final before you go enlist. <clears throat> You take another physical. Somehow this guy didn't go yeah. out, so I didn't even have a change of socks or clothes. I went. You didn't pack anything with you. you didn't didn't pack anything. anything. I went over there, and uh, the recruiter <laughs> gave him, bought me a toothbrush and a <laughs> razor, and we shipped on over to Wichita Falls, Texas, where we had to take the oath. They furnished his transportation over there. Me still wearing these same clothes. <laughs> got on a train, went to San Diego. Then I got issued clothing there for recruit training. Go to boot camp? Something yeah, similar boot to boot camp? Boot camp, San Diego. What, uh, what were your memories of boot camp? Uh, what were your memories of boot camp? Oh, I was probably a good one. I was good. Uh, Good recruit because I took orders. When they gave me an order, I didn't question it. And that was a good Navy system. And I learned that at home. <laughs> I, I learned that at home. And I nothing happened in recruit training except my girlfriend from Alta, Oklahoma. She came out to her. She had a brother or a sister in Coronado, California. So she came out there. And I saw her a couple, three times. Wow. And then uh, after recruit training. Well, Pop, no good stories about boot camp? None about waking up in the middle of the night and then throwing you around, making you go? Oh, no, I never bothered, they never bothered me. I, uh, discipline. No, I don't mean that. I mean, like, you know, the whole platoon, things that they made you, the whole platoon do, the hard work. I mean, any oh, stories? Oh, you had hard work, drill, but nothing. What'd they, what'd they pay you? Huh? What'd, what'd they pay you? Twenty-one dollars a month. Was that a lot of money? Huh? Was that a lot of money? <laughs> so you go to college for a year. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I paid the tuition. <laughs> it was a big well, all, all through the recruit training, I had one. They only got liberty on one time. Only got on the beach one time. <laughs> wow. But twice. I got off twice. Did they teach you about ships? Oh, some mostly is just drilling, teaching you discipline, and things like that. How to take care of your clothes. <clears throat> and when we graduated, we were sent to ships. I got the USS Nevada, the battleship. 
That's where my what, name is. What were you? What were you? Uh, what was your title then? I was. I was still a. a, a I was still a apprentice seaman, and uh, you got an automatic to seaman second class in uh, three months. I think it was. What were your duties? Well, just general duties on deck. Started out with uh, taking care of decks, training, and gunnery, and whatever was to be done, running boats, whatever happened to be where you were assigned. You assigned various duties. What were you assigned? Well, I was assigned first one and another. You got you switched around. One you time you mess cook, you had a job of mess cook. You had to serve, and, uh, you had to take your tour of that. Would you? And you what would you do with your money? What do you do? Uh, I don't know. Uh, what well, can you spend it there? Did you send it back home? Did you spend it? I had bad enough home? to send it back home. Twenty-one dollars a month. Right. No. But then I got thirty-six dollars a month. No, I didn't do much. Uh, what do you do with? What can you buy there? Well, you could, uh, started cigarettes. Uh, started smoking. Yes, then I started smoking. <laughs> I paid ten cents a pack for cigarettes. <laughs> but uh, well, it was thirty-six dollars a month. You could go to shore once a month. That way. That's good enough. Yeah, and over <laughs> now, I'm sure the tuition changed by then. Uh, tuition was a little higher by then, I would think. <laughs> uh, uh, Why'd you start smoking? Why? Peer pressure, probably. We started smoking. Oh, it was cool. That was. I didn't. Never had the uh, pressure of keeping my wind up, as they call it, the athletic. So we didn't. It wasn't. Nobody preached it was harmful to you. It was just something. Now the depression was still going on, huh? Oh yeah, it was depression. And then we got. I was a seaman second, and the depression came on. We got a five percent pay cut because of the depression. <laughs> how much? Uh, how long were you at sea before you started your tour in World War Two? Oh, that's a long time. Uh, well, while I was born in Nevada, I decided I that uh, probably on there. you got to be a, you, you strike, you start striking for a rate for what you want to be. So I, I got a chance to go in uh, as a yeoman, which is a clerical in personnel, hammer personnel. So I got started striking for that. I was still a seaman, but I was a striker for that. I worked in the office. And uh, we all had our battle stations. No matter where you were, you had a certain battle station, which we practiced. And, uh, well, not to jump ahead, so I want to go back, but what rank did you end up achieving? Uh, what rank did you get to? Well, I'll come to that. I got, uh, I was seaman first, and during the Depression, the next rate was seaman. I was, I was seaman second. The next rate was seaman first. Two years during the Depression, there was not one promotion in the entire Pacific Fleet. Wow. Wow. A seaman. So I, I made up my mind that I was going to get a promotion when they came, but when it opened, we had two books which you really studied. The exams came out of it. The 8 a.m. and the Seaman First Manual. I memorized it. And I was in the, of course, to be a seaman, you had to know a lot of things outside. I went and did all I could out on deck when I wasn't working. So finally we got a quota. Two ratings to go for the ship. That is all. And all of these seamen for a second. There's two of us made a perfect score, four of them. Or three. Right. Three of us made a perfect score. Well, how'd they do it for three of you? Well, they took us up on deck to uh, give us your practical. And I knew I could fail there because these guys were on deck. I knew it. When they came around, they said, uh, we were going, the final question says, let's see your pocket knife. One guy didn't have a pocket knife. Oh, he lost it because he did. He lost it. That's a very, that's a very essential thing when you're on board ship. Oh my God! That's a, 
But <laughs> so I made salmon first on the first opening. Is that amazing? Out of how many people would you say? Oh, I don't know. They must have been fifty or so taking the examination. Salmon second to go to salmon. What did you think of the sea the first time you saw it? What? What did you think of the sea the first time you saw it? Oh gee. <laughs> I pulled into San Diego and all that water. What about being on a boat for a long period of time? Huh? Being on a boat for a long period of time. Well, we weren't at that time we didn't get very long cruises because they didn't have money enough to buy fuel. That's true. <laughs> We'd go out and the ships did not make oh they would not allow them to make more than ten knots. They had to go slow. And our big guns, we would practice. They mounted one pounders on top of them, which you just had. We never did fire the big guns during that period. But we got the directors and all of that. We got our you know, point crews and the sight setters and all of that. We drill that, and uh, and they'd fire. They'd fire that one pounder on top of the gun. That was a depression. It's really kind of hard to imagine a depression to that extent. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, government doesn't even have fuel for a ship. What did you? And you couldn't yeah, buy. What, what year was that? Uh, what? what year was that? Thirty-one. Well, it was thirty-one, thirty-two. Well, here's my question. Overseas, what was happening? I mean, why did we really need a, need a navy? I mean, was there was there pressure overseas that well, you were aware? There's always a pressure over to keep a sea, but we did we were in bad shape, I'll tell you. But what was there was there a talk about Germany at that time? Or was it talk no, about No, not at that early time, but later on it kept getting bad in thirty one Was there talk of any country at that time? Not really, no. Okay. Not that I can remember of we was, Did you did you have any idea what was going on during World War One? Were you too young? World War One, I, I remember very little about. I remember the Armistice Day. Because there was a parade? And I remember the parade, the Armistice Day parade. And uh, we heard about it. We went to town. We got it over our telephone. At the, so we went to town in, in, Gar in Carnegie. And everybody was, they had uh, the fireworks, what they were making noises and all of that. And uh, the way they all had to make the big uh, an anvil. I don't know whether you know what an anvil is. Yeah. It's what the, the blacksmiths had. You drop on, the <laughs> on the bottom of the anvil, there's about a three inch square and about two inches deep. They put one anvil on top of the other. They fill that with powder, bottoms up, and set them together. And they put a fuse in there and they light them and pull the anvil up. <laughs> Say, Safe fireworks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the guy that lit the fuse was in big trouble, man. That animal came down the wrong way. But uh, <laughs> World War One. that's about all I remember about World War One. So I, I asked this already, but I don't think you answered. Did, did you have a radio? Oh, no. No radio yeah. at all. That's we all had radio. The only communication. Really. When we... Uh, Midnight? Nineteen thirty one, thirty. Yeah, about nineteen thirty. Nineteen thirty, I think it was. We got radios in Grandville, Oklahoma, I was then. I remember the first thing I heard was uh, in the hardware store. The hardware had one and he got one set it in the window there and, and the first real thing I remember hearing on the radio that was the world hemp champion fight between Dempsey and Furpole. Really? I was a real thing. So now we're talking about, we're, let's go back to 1933. So you're on the boat, you just made semen. Yeah. Then go ahead forward with that. Well, for the next two weeks, I stayed on the ship. What ship? I was on the battle. That was a battle. battleship. And, uh, I was a yeoman striker. I'm still a yeoman striker. There have been no promotions. And yeah, then finally, uh, what year it was, I made, they opened up uh, for promotion to yeoman third class. 
and I remember I forget what the competition was, but I is that a buck season pop? I got the I made the first opportunity I had. I made the only third. So that's a buck seaman. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was a petty officer then. Wait a second. So you went from you got your seaman, then what come after seaman? So you a third class petty officer. And then after third class petty officer comes you second, third, first chief, and then that's the top. Okay. What what, what does a seaman do exactly? Seaman he does doing just what he was doing. <laughs> uh, he gets more authority and more responsibility and. Let's see, okay, what's a uh, third, petty, petty, third petty officer? Do? Well, he's a petty officer. He used to learn to what supervise. He would do paperwork. He would do the, as he, well, it's whatever petty officer he was. If he was a third class radio man, he was in the radio shack. The, you know, I was a third class yeoman, I worked in the personnel office or the gunnery office or the first lieutenant's office or wherever it worked. Okay. What does the chief petty officer do? Well, he was usually supervised. There's fewer of them. It's just like Working in a civilian job, the higher you get, the more responsibility you have, the more supervision. Okay. When you slept at night, I mean, was this like a, a major barracks or something like that? Where you guys well, slept? Ship? In, yeah, on ship. No, we you had different rooms. Separate we rooms. had uh, two people. These uh, wire bunks, metal bunks, and they folded up against. Right. There was really three, four. About four deep most of the time. And you crawl in. So you had four people sleeping in the What about your mattresses? Where were they? They were little thin hair mattresses. Must yeah. have been uncomfortable. Well, yeah, like, no. well, how many people slept in a room, Pop? I, well, this is according to the size of your division or how big the eye was. That they, when that uh, bunks rolled up, while well, they had guns shooting out the ports there. You slept around guns. <laughs> so were there were there four of these things stacked on the wall? There were so, so there could on be three. On the wall, and then they move out another, and they had stanchions. Well, how many next to each other? Uh, uh, how many next to each other? I mean, well, we're that depends about, on how many what uh, so ship you're on, how many people in the division. Where'd you hang your clothes? How much room was there? Well, give me an estimate. I mean, we well, about some of them was uh, some of them would probably be thirty or forty, and some some of them five or six. What'd you do with your clothes? We had lockers. Yeah. You had the locker about, uh, oh, I don't know, about two foot square. So there wasn't a lot of room. Oh, no. And you didn't have a lot of clothes on there either. You fold, you learn to fold what says, what are the things that taught you. If you didn't have clothes that you hung up, Yeah. What, what, you roll them. Why you roll them? To keep less room. And keep wrinkles out, right? Yeah, yeah. less rooms. What personal items did you carry with you? Amazing. Just your razor related and you had nothing from back home. Any paper? Uh, no, nope. I mean, no, nothing personal. You carried in your boat. Like books or paper. I mean, books. Yeah, what did you say? Oh yeah, you had your stationery and stuff. Just, but you had to figure out how to keep it in that uh -huh. locker. You but uh, we never locked at that time. We never locked our locker. Would you? Why? Because people were on. We the money in. We took care of people. When anybody was caught doing anything, they got it. The captain turned his back. Uh -huh. That was the best discipline you could get. I mean, the very minor thing they ever did to discipline a guy, ostracizing. I mean, if a guy got to where he didn't, wouldn't take his baths and got dirty or something, he got ostracized. Which means no one talks to him? Yeah. Nobody talked to him. They get the word. Or, one of the good old things that they give him a sand and canvas bath. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> the captain and the officers would turn their backs and you'd go in there in the bath and you'd take a hand, the sand that you sanded the decks with oh, and a piece of canvas, you'd get the guy in there. So well, I guess he took baths after that. He'd take his baths out. He had no hair. The cleanliness <laughs> was. Jesus. What, at what rate do you uh, get to sleep, have different quarters? <laughs> well, okay, let's go on into that. I, uh, after the four years, I was a third class petty officer, and now it's time to be discharged. And the depression was still on, so I'd expect you could extend your enlistment for two years. So I thought, well, I'll extend my enlistment. And then go out, go out and save money. I'll go to Honolulu. 
if I could. So I extended and put in for transfer and got transferred to Honolulu. Why'd you want to yeah. Well, I was going to save money. I thought I'd go out there and really be no temptation, do nothing, save money. Well, you went to, you went to Honolulu thinking that there was no temptation. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> anyway, I think he's not telling us something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Anyway, I uh, I got my transfer. I went out there, and I was assigned to the a little mine sweepers. A really a big tug, and I was the only yeoman on there. I mean, I did all the work for all the typing, bookkeeping, everything else that was done. I did it, and uh, I stayed on there. I took up tennis, got to playing tennis. Where'd you box? You get a nice tan. We get the other. Battery. Oh, okay. and I we get the other battery. Went to school. I mean, went to. Uh, Beach. Played around a little. Any girlfriends? Huh? Any girlfriends? Boy, oh yeah, uh, I had uh, a little Japanese barber out there. I started dating, <laughs> and we got uh, pretty thick. You didn't go out with Leilani or anybody like that? Huh? <laughs> no, no Hawaiian girls or anything? I didn't date any Hawaiian girls. I dated a little. Uh, One of the prettiest little girls I ever met, I think, was a little uh, Portuguese, Japanese girl out there. I dated her a few times. She was a nurse. But uh, with the army, she was a nurse, or just no? She was a navy nurse. How long is this? So the, how long have you been in, in the? Uh, how long have you been now with? with uh, the I, got, I was four. I was four. I was in my fifth year. Did you still keep, you still kept in touch with your parents on a pretty regular basis or not? Uh, Did you write to your parents a lot? Oh yeah, sir. And I was sending them a little money now. And what, what was happening with them? Well, they not a lot changed. Just, How old are your brothers at this point? The younger brothers. My younger brothers were. What are they doing? Are they in school? Well, they were still going to school. Well, I I remember I how I wanted a bicycle when I was a kid. So my next brother, I. I went to Sears Roebuck catalog and I ordered him a bicycle. He got it. He never forgot it. <laughs> he got the bicycle. <laughs> what, uh, what about your older brother? What was he doing? He, he was working in the oil fields in Oklahoma. Were, were, who was, were you very successful? Like, well, he was a about. And he just <laughs> getting by. So back to the story, you're in Hawaii, you're playing I'm tennis. I'm in Hawaii, yeah. So, 1936, I was there. By then, the end of my career, we used to get on this little boat, this little minesweeper. We'd make from island to island out there, and we were a small slip ship, of course. It was a big tug, but our job was to sweep mines. That's what we would practice. But then I got the... No, go ahead, Pop, continue. Ted, Ted. The, uh... The U.S. Ogallala, U.S.S. Ogallala was a heavy mine wire, and she had orders to go to the Aleutian Islands to survey, take a civilians, a bunch of civilians up there to survey. Well, the yeoman on the Ogallala didn't want to go. So I thought, well, now I'll be able to save some money. So I... You went to what islands, did they call them? Lucian Islands, that little stretch of the islands out of Alaska. Man, you went all over the place. So I said, I'll take you, I'll swap with you. And so our commanding officers agreed. And I swapped duties with him. He was second class and I was a third class yet. So we swapped duties and I went to the... The Dilution Islands with this group. We stayed there six months on this survey without getting off the ship. So <laughs> or not getting off the ship, we got off on the islands. But we we were up there on the uninhabited islands. Did you take any pictures? Yeah, I had pictures. You had pictures of all these? Yeah. You know where those are? Yeah, I can't. There, I know about where they took some digging to get them. Okay. But we I stayed up there six months. And uh, 
from there we came back to... Well, what was your memory of those islands? Was there anything happening in those islands? Oh, it was cold most of the time. We got off on the islands and uh, we didn't go any place where they had any settlements or anything except Sitka and that so just... Uh, <laughs> Did you see a lot of Eskimos? Saw some Eskimos there, that's all. And then we, uh, I remember on at two, we went on board, went up on the island, and we had little narrow creeks like that. So we took our white hats and fished trout. <laughs> Get them against trout. That was that. Trout, bring them back to the ship. And, That's uh, a good question. What did you eat on the ship, the fish? Oh, we had a lot. Did, did they fish hot off the ship? Is that what we ate a lot of? Oh, yeah, we had fish. We had regular food all the time. I mean, was one of the responsibility of the sailors to actually well, fish? Well, there were certain ratings. And uh, we had the cooks and the commissary. The chief was in charge of the, had one chief commissary officers. I mean, commissary. He was the chief of the galley. He, Prepared the food. My question is, was there actually, were you sailors ordered to actually fish for food? No, 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 no. We just went over there. In fact, I'll take it back, I did stay over there on the island for about, uh, oh, for almost three weeks in camp. We, uh, the ship could not make enough water to stay, fresh water. So they built a tank and put in one of the boats and we went over and built a uh, dam over on that too. And they, we fill that with this. Ship fitters and whatnot built this and they built a dam. So I always went over there and helped supervise the dam. We stayed there for about three weeks. And didn't come back on board the ship. They'd bring us food. And then every time the boat would come in at night, it, take water back to the ship. Were you bored? No. no we, you learned to, you learn to entertain fun. yourself. How'd you entertain yourself? You watch sticks float down the river. How, that's exciting. <laughs> there you go. Tramp around. To read? Uh, Play a lot of poetry. There's only three of us on the beach. Wow. <laughs> we, stood, sure. we stood our watches. Did you thumb watch it for what? You know, you see the water oh, in, sure. going in. And that was, after that, that really wasn't much to that dude. You know, you back, your ship came back to the United, back to Hawaii. So now you got a, you only have about, what, another year left in your term before you're supposed to drop out? Yeah. Did you ever get in trouble during any of this? Huh? Did, did you ever get in trouble during your whole term? Ever get in trouble? Uh, never, I've got a good conduct medal each time I got discharged. And then to get a good conduct medal, you had to have no marks, wow. no disciplinary marks. That's, but I, I came back there and uh, I transferred from there to a destroyer, light mine layer, or what it was. It was a destroyer, though. And I stayed there. Some, uh, I was in charge of the office and there. And when my time was up, I decided to come back. I came back to the United States to be discharged. I was coming out, and I went back there and paying you. This is hard up there as it were. This is about 1935. Yeah. Was just, things were just as hard up then as it was. Who's president? The one, the two, the three, the four, the five. No, oh, I was 36, 37. Who's president? Rousseau. What can you what can you tell me about the presidents that you remember? Yeah, well anyway, well, I came back to the United States and I was going to get discharged. The things were hard up, so I reenlisted. Again, reenlisted, <laughs> and uh, I was in San Diego. I reenlisted, and I got signed to USS Argo. It was a kind of administrative repair ship and staff ship. And it didn't go very much. You just stayed in San Pedro. That was a good duty. I had a lot of time. <laughs> Where's San Pedro, Pop? What? Where's San Pedro? San Pedro is out of Los Angeles. It's the 
Harbor, Los Angeles. So Los Angeles Harbor, San Pedro, California. Out of all the places you visited, what's your favorite? Seattle. Really? Or San Francisco. <laughs> Seattle or San Francisco? In the U.S., though. But what yeah. about overseas? Everywhere. I didn't go very many places. Over what about Hawaii, Hawaii Leo? You well, Hawaii was, yeah, I liked Hawaii. It was good then because it wasn't like it is now. I, I got, I'll say I really enjoyed my duty in Honolulu because I played a lot of tennis, went to the shore a lot. How about women over in Hawaii? You missed that, right? <laughs> no, I missed that, huh? <laughs> Good. What about the, uh, now I know why he enjoyed Hawaii. What about the, uh, the presidents? What, what do you remember about these, the American presidents? I mean, are there... I don't remember too much because I was, I was really not into politics at that time. I, you don't get to read too many papers aboard the ship. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't have much radio news and uh, you just didn't keep up very good. And uh, I heard someone ask you this a long time ago and I heard your answer, but I'm curious what your answer is now or if it's, if it was in fact a real answer back then, but what do you think out of your whole life is the most amazing uh, invention you've ever seen? Gosh, I don't know. I don't know, Ted. I could. I, I what, what did he say? I heard. I heard. It was a Reynolds wrapper or a plastic wrap. Saran wrap. Saran wrap. Someone asked you a long time ago, and you said Saran wrap. But that might have been just because it was very useful at that moment in your life. Huh? <laughs> no, I, I figured it'd be TV or something a little more. Where the hell have you been? To, I don't know. <laughs> hey, I remember when Saran wrap came out. That was a big deal. Oh, it was. You bet. Okay. Yeah, you you think I don't know. I mean, I think a telephone is a little more important than yeah. a hand wrap. Sure. But anyway, <laughs> so, so it's I can microwave my food. Go ahead, Pop. Anyway, my career <laughs> there, I, uh, by that time I was, <laughs> I was second class. Thing. So you got a promotion. I, I got promoted. I was on the Argonne. And I got promoted to second class. And, uh, Are the times any better in the United States? They were. They weren't much better. They were getting better. So uh, I, at that time, what the hell did I do that? You're in San Pedro. Where did yeah, you go? I was in San Pedro on the Argonne, and I got. Oh, I. Uh, So what was it like living in Los Angeles? Uh, what was it like living near Los Angeles? Oh, it was good. I, while I was on the, in Los Angeles, I took up, oh, before I could get promoted to first class, I had to be able to take dictation. And there were times the Navy had a yeoman school, a school, a shorthand class, but every time I'd get ready to go, uh, some, the planning officer would say, well, I can't spare you now. They were very short of personnel. Can't spare you now. So you couldn't go. So while I was on the Argonne, it was a ship that didn't go out to sea much. I took up stenotype over it. And uh, had to drive all the way to Los Angeles. I had a car then. Drive to Los Angeles. And I took up stenotype so I could take my examination and I got where I could take a little dictation and opening came up and I made first class. Well, Pop, first how old are you at this point? This is probably 1937 so you're about 27. Oh, I was 36. Well, that was about 39. Wait a second. 38. You're married already then, are you not? No, no. I'm 38. I guess 37, 38. What year did you get, what, how old were you when you got married? Hey, he's cheating. He's looking in his book. <laughs> Two star. Mm -hmm. Forty-five. I got married in thirty-eight, March thirty-eight. So you were twenty-seven years old, yeah. uh, twenty-eight years old, right? When you got married. Yeah. So you that's what he's getting. Wait a second. Wait a second. At this point, right now, you're talking nineteen thirty-six, right? Yeah, thirty-seven. Thirty-seven at this point. Okay. And. Uh, well, I made first class, and then I was time to be re-enlisted again, I think. 
and I requested recruiting duty. And so I was on board ship, and we were going to sailing for the East Coast. When we got to Panama, I got orders to go to recruiting duty in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. I had to go to recruiter school, so when I got around to Norfolk, I got off. Well, let me ask you a question. Thanks for joining us for that segment. Coming up soon, you got to come back and hear my pop story about his experience in World War II. Those stories are incredible. Uh, just wait till you see some of these never before seen pictures I have. They're, uh, they're pretty amazing. And before I leave, you could also, if you're catching this on a rerun or something, you will see one of these boxes will appear here that should just lead you to the next story. If it's not up yet, then I haven't finished it yet. So it'll be up in a few weeks. As always, thanks for joining me. And, and remember, always have your pocket knife on you. To this day, I still carry a pocket knife, even a little dinky one, because of my grandpa's story about how that pocket knife changed his life. In fact, when he passed away, um, my uh, nephew actually put a pocket knife, put his pocket knife in uh, the coffin with him, I believe. So that's always been a thing for my grandpa. Always carry your pocket knife. I still do. He'd be proud of me.